So again, the title is Small and Ancient Grain Production, the new staple food for small farmers. I am Felicia Bell, um, the Ag Specialist for the Gulf States Regional Office located in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and we will get started. I first will briefly go over our last uh, particular class um, because I know we didn't have everyone at the first workshop. And so I wanted to summarize just briefly uh, the herb workshop that we had last Wednesday. So we talked about the difference between herbs and spices and briefly herbs is the leafy green portion and the spices are the root bark. All of the other part of the plant is considered spices. We also talked about cooking, processing, and storing herbs, growing commercially in various ways, and I do have a slide on that. And then we talked about where do we fit in as small producers in this herb industry market. And that particular section was just briefly talking about the monetary value of herbs at this time. And it ranges from a dollar a pound to $100 a pound. So it really depends upon your market and where you are. And of course, the herbs that you are growing and uh, providing for your community. Websites and books were shared, as well as Mississippi herbal businesses to reach out to for assistance. And I do have that slide as well. So the top benefits of growing herbs commercially was, I wanted to share this slide because it tells us the various ways that as small farmers, we can tap into the urban, the herbal industry. So you see is culinary, cosmetic, industrial, medicinal, landscaping, decorative and fragrance purposes. So again, various ways of small farmers really getting into the herbal industry in the manner that you see fit. So this include vegetables such as garlic, flavoring items such as red peppers or mint. You have decorative flowers such as roses. Of course, we have various oil seed shrubs, ground cover plants such as lemon thyme, or perennial chamomile. We also have edible flowers such as nasturtiums, trees such as linden or bay, and that's very popular on our Gulf Coast here in Mississippi. We have a farmer that has a huge, I mean a huge bay tree. It's so beautiful. So keep that in mind as well for your property. And then we have plants such as chrysanthemums that may be an intercropped and used as an alternative pesticide. Then benefits of herbs, and I wanna give a disclaimer. Um, the, the various things and definition and benefits of these herbs are strictly, I found them online as well as you can find them online as researching these particular herbs, but I am no way telling you to go out and start partaking of these herbs. You would definitely have to talk with your physician about adding any um, uh, of these regimens um, to your diet. So this is strictly educational purpose only. So the benefit of herbs is a we have oregano and of course they're rich in antioxidants which are compounds that help fight damage from harmful free radicals in the body and decrease inflammation sage high in anti antioxidants as well they support oral health reduce blood sugar levels we have time it lower blood pressure stop coughing it boosts your immunity and fungicidal properties Rosemary is high in antioxidants, antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory compounds. It improves mood and memory. It supports your brain, vision, and eye health. Mint, it improves irritable bowel syndrome, relieve indigestion, improve brain function, mass bad breath. Cilantro, it, it lowers blood sugar. It, it has immune boosting antioxidants. It's, it also benefits heart health and protect brain health. And lastly is parsley. It improves blood sugar, it benefits the heart health and aids in kidney health. And of course, this is just scratching the surface. It is thousands among thousands of herbs out there that you can go do the research on. And I want to uh, repeat myself that the 
benefits of these herbs is educational only that you do the your research and then contact your physician before you add them into your diet um, and your food regimen. Mississippi Herbal Businesses, we talked about Blue Boy Herbs in Carrier, Mississippi, um, Sine Natural Hair and Skin Products in Pickens, Mississippi, Trad Ag Wellness in Brandon, Littlefield of Herbs is also located in Brandon, PJ Farm in Socha, and then we have Harris Family Farm in Water Valley. Some of these farms I do know of personally. Um, Trad Ag Wellness is our particular business, my farm business that deals with uh, herbs um, and herb products. And then we have various others that I am familiar with. But please, again, do your research to find the best organization and person that can help you uh, get into the herbal industry. So that was a brief synopsis of our last workshop. And today we're going to talk about, again, ancient grains, small grains. So ancient grains or heritage grains are a grouping of seed or fruit-based cereals, which traces roots as far as the beginning of civilization. These heritage grains have been cultivated for thousands of years, but didn't achieve the prominence modern grains like corn, rice, and wheat got. But luckily, heritage grains have been continually cultivated organically in different communities around the globe, and because these grains remain natural, they are the stuff of healthy eater dreams. They make a great choice and a healthy addition to grains and carbs since they are less refined and apparently contain a higher amount of essential nutrients. So have you tried these ancient grains? And I know most of us have tried some of these. So we have millet, barley, teff, oats, frique, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, bulgur, sorghum, farro, einkorn, and then we'll move to our second page, emmer, quinoa, amaranth, buckwheat, chia, couscous, wild rice, corsan wheat, which is kamut, and spelt. So if you haven't tried any of these grains, look them up and see, can you start adding them into your kitchen? They're very, very healthy for us, and that's what we're going to get into. So the nutritional benefits of our ancient grains, these heritage grains are all said to be more nutritious and healthier than modern grains, and they are said to contain more protein. So the nutritional properties of grains are varied and sometimes unique to a, to a variety. So oats, for an example, have a hefty level of thiamine. The chia, it doubles in fiber content compared to other grains. And then our spelt has a high level of manganese. So ancient grains, and they're often referred to as super grains. They are said to be rich in protein, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids. Ongoing research shows that these healthy grains are likely to decrease the cholesterol level in consumers. Some grains are celebrated for being gluten-free, but not all ancient grains are gluten-free. So we have millet, teff, buckwheat, quinoa, and amaranth are gluten-free. But we have to keep in mind that oats, and the ancient kinds of wheat, like the core sand and spelt, are not gluten-free. Now, as we know that ancient grains have been around for so long, but of course they were known as for survival. So they grow in some of the harshest conditions and they practically thrive on neglect. Most heritage grains are also long storing, like buckwheat, kamut, and spelt, which survive for as long as 30 years or longer when stored properly. And I want to repeat that. We have to make sure we're storing our grains properly or we will not have that longevity. With that being said, though, ancient grains are definitely your ultimate survival food item. So now I can safely conclude that these ancient food sources could be the food of today and tomorrow. Not only did these foods survive without intervention and manipulation, they've nourished our ancestors and can nourish us just as well. 
So again, I want to briefly stop for a moment. If you have a question, please, you can add it into the chat. We will have a Q&A at the end, but I always just like going through the presentation and then we can open it up for questions at that time and comments at that time. So some of our ancient grains, and I'm not going to go over all of them. I would love for you to do your own research and see what pulls at your heart uh, to possibly grow on your farm. Uh, but I will uh, kind of, uh, you know, concentrate on a few of our ancient grains. So one of them being emmer. It is a whole wheat that was one of the earliest to be cultivated. It can be found growing in Armenia. Morocco, Spain, and Carpathian Mountains, Albania, Turkey, Switzerland, and Germany, Greece, and Italy. It's also getting a bit of a hold in the United States as a specialty crop. So emmer is a useful discovery, not just for its nutritional value, its agricultural worth lies in its ability to thrive in poor soils. It also has a resistance to fungal diseases that are prevalent in wet regions. The hull makes it durable and easier to grow organically as well. So again, that is emmer. And this is a picture of emmer uh, right here uh, on this particular slide. So another small grain, an ancient small grain, is spelt. It was originally cultivated in what is now Iran and possibly simultaneously in southeastern Europe. It was a staple of its day and is one of the very first wheats used to make bread. So the hull protects its nutrients and stays on until right before it's made into flour. So spelt was introduced to the United States in the 1890s. Now it's resurfacing as a healthier and more pure option compared to normal wheat. It hasn't undergone so much alteration and thus retains many of its original qualities, which is always a good sign for health food lovers. And again, this is a picture of spelt on this particular slide as well. And another, einkorn. Let's take a look at the most ancient wheat there is. Einkorn, also called farro piccolo, is known as nature's original wheat. It is the only type of wheat that has never been hybridized. And that just means crossing two genetically different individuals to result in a third individual with a different set of traits. That's all that means. And because of its ancient, because it's so old, that has not happened to this particular wheat. And it still only has two sets of chromosomes. So in non-scientific language, that just means it is pure. It's 12,000 years ago. That's how pure it is. That's how old it is. The presence of einkorn waned into relative non-existence until September of 1991 when Helmut and Erica Simon decided to go for a little hike in the Italian Alps. And these two hikers discovered a body sticking out of a melting glacier. He later became known as Otzi, the Iceman. So maybe you have heard of him, maybe not. But his body, along with the last thing that he ate, was preserved in ice for over 5,000 years. So what do you think was present in Otzi's last meal? You guessed it. It was Icorn. So Icorn has only been in our modern day hands for the last 29 years. So that's pretty fascinating. This is a picture of Icorn. Um, and I apologize, I transitioned uh, and, and I wanted to transition to this location and I wanted to show you einkorn, but this is the substitute, a picture of it on screen. Uh, but very, very just phenomenal to learn about. And I just recently learned about this particular wheat um, 
yeah, probably in the last year. Uh, so just very, very glad that I'm getting to learn and research these ancient grains. So we're going to transition to small grain production. So small grains is a term oftentimes used to describe wheat and its relatives. So when you hear small grains, usually we're talking about cool season crops like winter and spring wheat, winter and spring barley, oats, and rye. So small grains can produce profitable yields of grain for the cash market or farm feeding. And equally important is the value of straw as well as a crop. So the soil type and pH. Oats and rye tolerate acid or poorly drained soils better than wheat or barley does. So nevertheless, though, maximum yields of both crops are attained on moderately well-drained or well-drained soils with a pH above 5.8. So for maximum wheat production, wheat must be cropped on moderately well-drained or well-drained soils with a pH above 6.0. And then barley, it requires well-drained soils with a pH above 6.3. The same is needed for alfalfa production. Spring grains. So spring grain should be sown as early in the spring as possible. So all spring grain should be sown with a grain drill to a depth of one to one and a half inch. The optimal seeding rate for oats is 96 pounds uh, per acre and kind of like 25 pounds per quarter acre. Three bushels per acre, which is three quarters bushel per quarter acre. So spring barley, and spring wheat do best at two bushels per acre, or if we're talking about a smaller, half a bushel per quarter acre. So if oats or barley is to be used in forage seeding, seeding rate should be reduced by 50%. And again, that's small grains. I mean, I'm sorry, spring grains, I'm sorry. Now, winter grains. Winter wheat should be planted with a grain drill to a depth of one, to one and a half inches. The optimal planting is thus from mid-September until early October in most regions of winter wheat production. Now, but depending upon the fall or winter conditions, we can be successfully planted until early November, but it will have a lower yield potential. So you have to make the decision on the best time in your region to plant based upon your fall and winter conditions. Because, of course, we know as various places in the country um, that can kind of push some of their planting um, times back. Uh, into the season and some we can do a little bit earlier. So please make that decision for yourself based upon your environment and your conditions. So soft wheat winter wheat has a broad optimum seeding rate range and it rates of, of about 120 pounds or two bushels per acre. And that usually result in the highest grain and straw yield. So if planting is delayed beyond early October, the optimal rate is 150 pounds or two and a half bushels per acre. Again, you make, make the judgment on when you want to plant. Now, the soft red winter wheat also has a broad optimum seeding rate range and rates between a million and a million point five seeds per acre, resulting in highest grain and straw yields. So again, these are the various uh, conditions that you can plant winter grain. Now, winter barley can thus be planted a few days earlier than wheat. That is from September 10th to September 20. And of course, again, depending on where you are in the country, you may have to adjust those dates. It is best to sow the seed with a grain drill at a depth of one to one and a half inches. Seeding rate should be in the 96 to 120 pounds per acre or two to two and a half bushel range. Now, rye. Rye is the hardiest of all winter grains and thus can be successfully established with an early to mid-October planting date. For seed production, rye should be sown with a grain drill at a depth of one to one and a half inches, 
the seating rate should be in the 110 pounds or a two bushel range. Now, I want to stop two things um, that, well, one of the things I wanna share is the grain drill um, and the reason for that. So you kept seeing that it's best to sow these seeds with a grain drill. And so one of the things I want to share with you, you need to check in your particular area, but sometimes you're able to rent a grain drill from your county office, and that would be your soil and water conservation district, um, which is usually housed with NRCS. So your local, your county NRCS agent, agency rather, uh, and, and office usually have someone, if not in that same location, but maybe in your area from the Soil and Water Conservation District. So please check on that for your area that you possibly can um, rent a, a grain drill or what some have heard of it as a no-till drill. Um, and the reason for that is, as you saw on the picture of our ancient grains, our small grains, of course, with that name, they're very, very tiny. And so a lot of us like to just broadcast our seeds, but some, you know, vegetable crops as well as grains don't do very well with broadcasting. We actually have to have that, that seed and soil contact. And so I wanted to just stop briefly to let you know that you don't have to get into trying to purchase this for yourself that some of our counties do have it available to rent. Now the insects are small grains. Army worm is one of them and then the cereal leaf beetle is the other. Now beneficial insects for army worm are the trichogramma wasp, the lace wing, we have ladybugs and the um the I always said minute or minute, I never know which one, uh, pirate bugs. And then of course, having things on your property to attract birds. And then our beneficial nematodes. Those are some of the beneficial insects that can help you with army worm infestation or if you see army worms on your grains. And so um, one of the reasons I wanted to share beneficial insects, again, you know, National Center for Appropriate Technology, we always want to share the sustainable methodologies of dealing with insects. And so, of course, beneficial insects is one of them. So we have the cereal leaf beetle. So beneficial insects for cereal leaf beetle is the parasitoid wasp and then the ladybug. So again, um, these are some beneficial insects that really can handle uh, any pressure you have, predator pressure you have from the army worm and the cereal leaf beetle, which again, these are insects of small grains. Now, the needs of production. So we want to definitely make sure that you're evaluating the suitability of these specific crops for your operation. Of course, most of us can't grow all of these grains. Um, but again, what is pulling at you and your heart? And then you take that and do the research and see, is this something that I really can grow on my land? Because that's the key. If our soil is not conducive to grow these grains, then we cannot. And so first and foremost, what grain do you feel like you would like to uh, grow? And then doing the research to see if your soil can handle it. Then we want to recognize the interactions of cover cropping and crop rotation with these grains. We want to identify our scale, appropriate equipment and applications. And I want to make sure that I add in here that keep it a minimum. Um, I, of course, we have to have some equipment and some site type of applications we will have to tweak on our, in our operation if we have never grown grains, but try to keep it to a minimum. Make sure you do the research to see, do I need all of these things? One source that I would like to always put in these workshops is YouTube. Most of us will go to YouTube and we'll learn and watch other farmers. Please do that with this because I have seen some tremendous videos on grains and they have some equipment, but not very, very expensive equipment, and they are using 
things that they have built, DIY uh, 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 operating type things to, to utilize uh, getting those seeds uh, from the crop. So please do your research. Don't get into spending a lot of money on equipment if you don't need it. And then what tasks are involved in grain farming? We want to know what do we have to do? How many people do we need? Do we have to hire labor or labor, or can we utilize friends and family for pre-planting and post-harvesting? Then we want to employ harvest storage and market strategy. So again, we want to always maximize our quality and our profitability. So that means you got to think ahead on harvesting, storaging, and marketing. Then we definitely want to understand the financial aspects of small scale grain production. And then of course, always, always, always developing a enterprise budget for just grains, not your whole farm budget, but adding in that enterprise budget and the grain enterprise budget uh, to what I hope most of our farmers already have. And that's doing your record keeping and keeping a tight budget uh, for your farm. Now, commercial uses for uh, revenue um, on these particular grains, barley could be utilized and sold to breweries. And then, of course, bakeries, landscape, home gardeners and basket weavers. So crafts dealing, you know, beautifying, using it that way. Uh, again, remember we talked about straw uh, from our crops and that's how that could be utilized. Cereal and granola creators. So we have a lot of people that partake of cereal and granola. Um, and then we, we can help others even get in business locally, creating this for the local area. So keep that in mind when you start thinking about the grains, uh, grain selection for your farm. Then we have seed savers. We may have someone that you can sell the seeds to. So you're growing it, but it could go straight to industry for uh, those seeds to be able to sell to other farmers. And then oat milk producers. So again, we know that we can make uh, our milk from these various, uh, some of these various grains. Uh, I put oat there, but of course we have our uh, rye milk. So we have all of these different types of opportunities and then lastly livestock feed so just keep that in mind on and of course this again is just scratching the surface this is just an example of a few things that you possibly can do uh, to bring in the revenue from producing grain now, sample rotations, and what I mean by this is your crop rotation, moving uh, this around on your farm. And these are just a few examples. Uh, produce farm, if you are a produce farm, for an example, you could have sweet corn. Then after that sweet corn, you rotate into a winter cover crop of rye or hairy veg. Then you do an early potato followed by buckwheat as a cover crop. Then your next would be squash. Then you have oats, red clover, and you plow that down. And then you go right into uh, sweet corn. And so again, that's the various ways for a produce farm to have a rotation. And I wanna put a little disclaimer in here for livestock usage. The red clover that I just mentioned, when they said plow down, that is a way you could use, um, um, you, can, you can actually plow it in, or you also can use a crimper. And that just means that you're laying it down and then it becomes a green manure. Uh, so basically you're breaking it off at the stem and it dies in its spot. And then you're able to go in with a drill and then plant your next uh, uh, crop. And so, but that's a plow down. But when we're talking about livestock usage, red clover for large and small ruminants can be utilized, but limited, a limited access because it could cause bloat in those animals. So if you have a whole field of red clover, you cannot whatsoever just put those animals in there and leave them. Uh, it's, 
put them in, bring them out. It's just limited access. Just want to make sure I put that in there for any of our farmers that do have livestock. And then next uh, example is for a produce farm is tomatoes or other heavy feeders. You plant that. Then next you have a winter cover crop of rye or veg. Then you have your cucurbits, which is our squash, cucumbers, and melons. Then you rotate into a spring wheat, after which you move into your brassicas, which is your cabbage and broccoli. Winter cover crop of rye and veggies would be next. Then you rotate into greens, which is spinach or lettuces, or an annual herb. From there, you move into carrots or other root crops. Then you have the winter cover crop of rye and veg. Peas and green beans or edamame would be next. I mean, I'm sorry, peas, green beans, edamame or soybeans. Um, and then you move into a winter cover crop of rye veg and then back to tomatoes. And so uh, let me correct myself again. So edamame is a soybean, but an edible soybean. I made it seem like it was two different things. So we do know we have soy meat, soybeans that are, are produced for animal livestock feed that's not usually edible for humans. And then we have the edamame soybean. So now buckwheat can be planted between lettuce crops or after peas. And so again, these are just two examples of a produce farm for as a crop rotation adding in um, your grains. And then one more example of feed usage. So grains can be an economical way to reduce the feed cost for poultry as well. So some farmers, they cut the mature grain and then leave it in the field for chickens to harvest themselves. So however, some cereal grains, barley in particular, can be detrimental to poultry in large quantities. So again, this is like what I just spoke of with the small and large ruminant with red clover. Barley is that for poultry. So they cannot have a just an abundance of barley, but you can give it to them in small amounts. So it will it, it also as well creates some type of uh, uh, bodily harm if you give them too much barley. Uh, so we want to make sure we're not doing that to our animals. Now the resources, and please take note on this. Organic small grain production is one of our publication. Um, if that's something that you want to look into for is doing small grain, but doing it on organic production uh, methodology, we as ATRA, uh, NCAT within our ATRA uh, project have a publication. So please uh, go and look that up. And then John Jevons, um, he is a gentleman that I've followed for many, many years because of the way he farms, which you see here on the screen. And for our callers, it's called Grow Biointensive Method. And I have always been drawn to him because of the biointensive, meaning you do not have to have large acreage. It could be very small acreage, but you're planting so very close, very intensive, uh, but it works. And again, it works because you're rotating. You really get into that regimen and you're making sure you're healing the soil after you grow all of these various grains and produce and um and other things on our farm and again his website is growbiointensive.org o-r-g another resource is a guide to ancient grains for homesteaders and that is coming from homesteading.com again an guide to ancient grains for homesteaders and that can be found at homesteading.com and then the sources that I utilized for this presentation was Cornell Small Farms Program, of course, John Jevin at Grow Biotensive Method, Southern Small Grains Resource Management Handbook at uh, University of Georgia Extension. I also utilized University of Kentucky Small Grains Program and then Oregon State University Extension, and then a person that I had the awesome time of meeting and sitting uh, at his feet was Mark Dempsey of the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. That was a, a live presentation 
with Mark and as well as Mark is also on YouTube. So you can you can listen to him as well and find his information. Uh, oh, wow. He's a wealth of information when it comes to grains. And then ancientgrains.com and again, homesteading.com. And so again, I'm Felicia Bell. This is my contact information and please reach out to me if you uh, have any questions or suggestions after we finish this presentation because sometimes we have to let it uh, get a little concentrated in our brain and then we come up with so many questions after facts. So please reach out to me if you have any cool questions or suggestions for uh, this presentation or if you have some suggestions for presentations in the future. Uh, we welcome that because this is what we're here for. We want to make sure um, that we're offering our services to you um, and we want, we always want feedback from our farmers and our gardeners and, and livestock producers. So at this time, I wanted to unmute everyone and you can ask questions, suggestions, comments. You could do that at this time. And I have unmuted everyone, so I'm assuming you may be um, muted on your end, so you're able to do that at, that at this time if you would like to speak. So I'm hoping, I guess, everything was understandable. I hope I didn't go too, too fast um, on presenting this. I'm just just to share a little, um, and again, it's still open for questions, um, but I wanted to share that um, this has just really been exciting for me to learn about. Um, I've always wanted to grow grains, but never took the time to do it. Um, even as I was growing up, we did not do grains. Um, at, on our homestead, we had everything else, but that uh, was one of the things we had to go to the grocery store for. And so, uh, but I know that it's an intricate part of our farm. Um, but now coming forward, I have a, a, a little boy that loves to bake. And so I said, okay, we may need to move into, into just small plots, not anything large, uh, but just small plots of grains to help him just in his business uh to where he can learn how to work with these ancient grains and and small grains and and just let him learn on his own free will um and so that's one reason why i'm so interested in it and know that it could be um you know a way to move into a different um financial operation, just another stream of income for uh, our farms. And that's the purpose of doing this presentation. Um, so just wanted to share that with you. And and again, is the floor is open for any questions, comments? Oh, hey, Miss Felicia, how are you? Great. How are you today? Oh, not too bad. And um, you said small plots. What I mean, what are you hundred by hundred? I mean, what 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 are you what are your measurements kind of? I'm I'm just curious. Yes. So, um, and I thank you for asking because we just start plowing up and and getting ready for all of this on yesterday. So we're very close. So, um. Most of my where I think I want to place my grains, it is not a hundred foot long. So we're talking about possibly half of that, maybe a fifty to sixty foot, and right at probably about ten foot wide. So it is. We did teal up yesterday, and then I will. I'm going to be rowing it, so I will have it in in a row crop manner. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so that's the gist of what I was going to move into. Again, this is trial and error, so I haven't <laughs> I haven't done this yet. I don't know if it's going to work. But now again, remember I said I got my idea from John Jevons. Small plots, meaning tightly planted, so very right. tight, tight, tight together, and that's the methodology that I was going to employ. Okay, sounds good. I appreciate that. Um, okay. Other question I had. This is the first conference I've or one of these I've been to. Um, usually I'm at work. I'm just happened to be off today and saw the, um, notice for it. Um, like, is this presentation available somewhere so my wife can see it? Cause I know she'd like to hear this cause I know she likes ancient grains and stuff. 
Yes, yeah, so I definitely can send it to you individually, but I also, I wanted to talk with our IT department and see if we could get it uploaded on our website somewhere. And so um, what, first and foremost, I can send it to you individually. So my information, as you can see, is on the screen. If you could um, just send me your email address and I can send it to you directly. Uh, okay. But definitely, I want to see if in the future we can start putting these up somewhere where you can view it at later dates and, and be able to even type in the name and be able to pull it up. Mm -hmm. that, that'd be awesome because I don't always, during the middle of the week, I always don't get a chance to sit in on these. So that, that would be awesome if that was something that could be done. <laughs> of course. But yeah, for short term, please, please send me your um, email address at that Felicia B at NCAT.org. That would be most helpful and I, I can definitely get it, get it to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good, thank you. Any other questions, comments? We have a few more people on, so I just definitely don't, you know, I definitely don't want to rush. If you have comments, questions, um, you could bring them up at this time. And then again, I wanted to share again uh, my email address with everyone, as you can see on the screen. If it be questions, comments, um, just like you think like, oh, that really didn't make any sense or something like that and say, hey, can we talk more on that? I'm so welcome and open to that. Um, um, so again, um, the Felicia B., at NCAT, NCAT, excuse me, .org. And I did make a mistake. I apologize. And I don't mind. I don't mind because that number on the screen is my personal cell phone, but that cell phone number is a business number. So I'm, I don't mind people utilizing it. But our office, my office number uh, here is 479-575-1300. One three eight six. So I definitely apologize for putting the wrong number up there, but I, I welcome anyone to call that number. That is a business number uh, as well. Just just know that is that six zero one number is a personal uh, number uh, versus the office number. But I thank you, thank you so much for joining me today, and and we still again have more time, and and because I am trying to keep this at an hour. Um, so definitely don't want to hold anyone's time, um, but uh, you're welcome to leave if you need to. But I'm still here uh, to answer questions or suggestions or comments that you have. And again, I wanted to thank, I don't think I have anything, but I want to thank you for joining us today. And the next time, and I apologize, I did not put up the next particular workshop, um, but if I remember correctly, and I may be wrong, I hope I'm not messing this up, I think it is value added. I know on our, if you would go back to the flyer that was shared with you over Facebook or email, however you receive the flyer, uh, the other dates and presentation topics are on that flyer. Uh, so we welcome you to join us um, for those particular topics. And we have discussed in our office these this particular weekly Wednesday workshops are going into June, but as all of us know, we don't know how long this is going to last. Um, and I want to continue this. So please share that as well with us and our office. Um, if this is something that you want us to continue when we're you know, able to uh, see each a other. Good source for the seeds. Uh, I... For the grains. Yes, sir. So what I did was I did a little research and was able to find a few companies. So me in particular, I don't have a particular company um, that I can share with you. I just did research and found the particular variety that I wanted and then purchased it from them. And so I apologize that I don't have one company that I can just say, hey, go here and buy. Um, yeah, I don't I don't have any loyalty to one company for these particular grains. Um, so I know my einkorn, I purchased it from uh, I, I believe it's pronounced um, Azure Standard uh, is A Z 
A-U-R-E standard. And, and it is online, azurestandard.com. Um, I personally, it is, it is a uh, buying club. This was a, a personal use uh, entity that I used. Um, so it is a buying club. Uh, it is free to join or what have you. Uh, but uh, it, that is one, that's a place where I got the um, iron corn. And I know they had other grains, but I was in particular, of course, wanting to get the, that. And I did find... Oh my goodness, what was it? Um, Salt Spring Seed, I think. Uh, a gentleman, he had ancient grains that I was looking at. Uh, but again, I, I won the, the new Salt Spring Seed, I believe it is. Um, and I found that on YouTube as well. I was watching his video. They did kind of like a small documentary on his place. And he just have traveled the world and have learned about various ancient grains and, and grains that are good for our body. Um, and so I just went to his website and just saw those grains. So I apologize. I don't have a particular company, but I definitely want to share those two with you that that I have utilized. Can you all share with me how you all are interested in grain and doing it on your place? Do you, do you mind sharing in what manner and why do you want to get into grains? Hello, how you doing? Hi, how are you today? I'm great. Well, I just found it, you know, the 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 title interesting so i didn't know that uh you could actually grow grains in a small area you know i'm normally seeing large areas of grains like soybeans and you know oats and wheat and stuff like that and most of the time farmers have you know livestock and they're basically growing it for or like you said uh producing it for you know commercial uses and things like that so i have a small space and I grow like uh, herbs and things like that. I grow tomatoes and basil. I have some growing right now, but I don't have, uh, I have space, but I have issues with flooding in my area. Oh, okay. So it's not really, uh, I guess the best idea to just actually put like plots here yet. So I'm trying to, uh, figure out a way to build my ground up so I can have it level where as I can put plots, you know, together and stuff like that. But I find it interesting that you can actually grow them in small spaces, which is pretty interesting, you know, to say the least. And I've I've worked in research. I'm actually uh, a ag educator with Alcorn State University, so oh, yes. I've conducted. I've conducted some research, of course, with amaranth. And before, I didn't know that people actually used the seeds as cereal. And people actually, you know, eat it like like it's cereal. So um, that was something really interesting. So th the title kind of, you know, kind of caught my eye. So I was like, when I heard amaranth, I was like, okay, this could be interesting, you know. <laughs> Yes, so. ma'am. I thank you so much for that. And, and that's the reason why I was trying to give these catchy titles to draw people in, because we right. do think that it's supposed to be on a large scale because that's all we have ever seen. And right. but again, like I said, this person that John Jevons, he's a gentleman and he's just one of many, but he's just been around for so long. And again, he have helped various uh, people around the world learn this biointensive method. Method, and that's where I learned it from that you can grow grain in small plots, just like we do our vegetables, like, like what we call our raised beds for our vegetables. Yeah. He mm -hmm. was like, you could do a, a raised bed size, not necessarily have to be in a raised bed, but the size of a raised bed, you could grow grains in. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never yeah, would have thought that at all. <laughs> right. That's pretty interesting. You know, I, I kind of like into that. So I, I think I'm going to do more research on it myself, too. So 
Please hmm. do, please do, because this is, like I said, we are all experienced trying times at this time, you know, not knowing, you know, what to do, where to go, what we gonna be after this, uh, but trying to stay positive and, and help farmers realize that, hey, we can still manage, we can still move, right. we still have to plant, we still have to raise our animals. But in the meantime, let's think about other operations. What can we yeah. implement during this time that don't cost a lot of money, you know? And so that's the purpose of these workshops is to just help our farmers, one, kind of start uh, concentrating on something else and, and, and to keep it mindfulness and positive uh, while we're going through this. Because again, we're, we still got to do what we do as farmers, um, but let, let's look at how can we pivot uh, in these trying times and, and, and possibly uh, be a better farm on the outset of this and say, oh, well, I was added to able to add two operations or expand my operation during this time. Um, because we all know that the, the financial resources is going to be is needed now and it's going to be needed later. So that's the purpose for this. But please, please. And, and you you have my contact information. We work with all corn staff a lot. That's one of our partners. So I would love to hear from you. Um, I think it's Miss Smith. Yes, ma'am. Our dear is Smith. Yes, ma'am. I would love to hear from you in the future if you're able to create some type of research. Uh, I know you say you have been researching Amarith. If you continue yeah. that research and add to it and, and add in some farmers, I would love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will do that. I will do that. And I, got, I, I, I tried to uh, send the information to some of my uh, clientele, some of my small farmers. So they, you know, I know some of them kind of you know, thinking about doing certain things and, and starting their own little enterprise and stuff like that. So I, I think I'm going to send them this information to kind of see, you know, if they will be interested in just, you know, taking a look at it and, you know, going through it. Yes, yes, ma'am. And please, please send me your email address um, so I can forward this PowerPoint to you because I would okay. love for you to share with them um, as well as, um, just, uh, you know, learning about it. We're here as the technical assistance uh, to assist them to get started if they choose to. Um, so, yes, ma'am, we would be more than than happy to assist you with those uh, farmers and stuff just to, to get, you know, get started. And uh, one other thing I wanted to share with you, uh, the reason we're using this particular platform, and I know it's others out there, if you have mm -hmm. any farmers, I wanted to share with you, if you have any farmers, that are just not internet savvy, uh, please mm -hmm. share uh, the phone numbers. We set this platform up so we can get callers as well as um, online participants. Okay, uh, so okay. Please let your farmers know, don't shy away uh, thinking that you won't be able to participate. Okay, I actually did some, I'm actually doing, I'm still in the process of doing my uh, research as far as a graduate student. So, my uh i'm I'm doing like intercropping so yes. i i've used sage uh i've used uh lavender and i've used basil um and we planted like tomatoes and red cabbage and um collard greens so some of what i planted uh i think it was i, I started planting late so some of my crops didn't actually get to the height that i wanted them to be at mm -hmm. before i harvested so uh, I think some of it came out okay as far as the intercropping, because what I was trying to do is, is kind of understand the, the activities in the soil, you know, when you have different crops, you know, crop diversities and stuff like that in your plot. So pretty much I think everything has paused on me because of this pandemic. So I'm at a standstill right now. I can't even start my planting process uh, because oh, of this pandemic. So. But gotcha. yeah, I find this very interesting because I'm I, I have been trying to find ways of of trying to think of a different enterprise to go in because I I love farming and I love research so that's that's why it just caught my attention so I say I'm going I'm going to participate. 
<laughs> I appreciate that so much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and and see, you're doing something that a lot of our farmers don't know about, like the intercropping. So see, you're doing yes. research that most small farmers have never done. And so right. just that in itself is just, that's what the farmers need. They, they got to figure out different methods. Like yes. what else yes. can I do on my farm? What, what else can I add? You know, yes. and I hope that our farmers with what we're going through become a little bit more open-minded to that. Mm -hmm. You know, not no okay. stay where you are and let's add some yes. things. <laughs> yeah. Because our environment is, is steady changing. The the economy is steady changing, you yes. know. So yes. that's it. and then it's a lot of it's a lot going on. It's a lot of buildings being built, a lot of trees being cut down. So we're losing a lot of our soil health and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah. It's My a lot going on. Though. It really is. But I thank you so much. I thank you for your participation. And again, I I definitely would love to hear from everyone on here. If it's, you know, again, wanting the PowerPoint, I welcome to share that with you as uh, well as hopefully we could get it on our website uh, for future, you know, being able to point to, you know, point it to people uh, to go and watch. So uh, I thank you so much for everybody joining us. And again, if you have any other questions that you think of after this presentation, please reach out to me again. Um, the email address is Felicia B, F-E-L-I-C-I-A, B as in boy at NCAT.org. And on the screen is my cell at 601-955-0339. And then the office number is 479-575-1386. So again, I thank everybody for joining us. And if it's nothing else, we could close it out. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us.